Hello everyone, welcome to tonight's program. My name is Yap Yi and I will be your host for tonight. I hope everyone is fine and safe, avoid going out or roaming around. Always remember to wash your hands and avoid touching your face. And most importantly, stay at home. These broadcasts are brought to you by our fellow JPO members and some of the world's greatest musicians that wishes to share their knowledge and help aspiring musicians through their musical journey. We are also providing opportunities for everyone with different interests to learn not performance, but transferable life skills. We are doing this series of program because JPO think this will be able to help in uplifting the spirit of everyone in this long period of lockdown. If you have any questions to ask, please type them in the Q&A below. JPO are indeed very honored to be able to invite Alicia Silverstein as our special guest for tonight. BBC Music Magazine award-winning violinist Alicia Silverstein, praised for her elegant, wonderfully inventive playing and her highly emotionally intelligent approach to music making, is equally at home as performer on historical and modern instruments as a soloist with orchestra, giving recitals and playing chamber music. Her inventive and thoughtful approach to concert programming, as well as the sincerity and exuberance she brings to musical communication, distinguishes Silverstein as one of the most important voices of her generation. Silverstein made her London recital debut in 2015 with a sold out concert at the Spitalfields Music Summer Festival, and subsequently appeared as a soloist with ensembles, including the Norwegian Barokanarna, Cathedra Camerata, Ensemble Odyssey, the Steinitz Bach Players, Paulus Baroque Ensemble, the Colin Byrne Orchestra, the Cambridge Consensus, the M. Brunet European Baroque Academy Orchestra, and the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. Silverstein has collaborated with Enrico Onofri, Patrick Ayrton, Richard Egar, Robert Levin, Naruhiko Kawaguchi, Ani Kavafian, Paul Coletti, and members of the Iben Quartet. A founding member of the ensemble, Harmonical Miscellany, Silverstein's debut album, The Dreams and Fables I Fashion was met with critical acclaim and earned her the BBC Music Magazine's Best Newcomer 2020 Award. Alicia Silverstein was the 2019-2020 to Artist in Residence at the Washington National Cathedral and currently serves as Assistant Professor of Violin at the University of Delaware, dividing her time between Italy and the United States. Everyone, let us welcome... Alicia Silverstein. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our program. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you with us here. So can you share about the video that we have watched just now? Sure. Um, so the first video uh, was of a piece called the Bieber Pasacalia. So it's a piece written in around 1676. And... Uh, it was, uh, I recorded it in Boston, I think it was 2014, in the summer after my first uh, year studying historical performance in Amsterdam. Um, so I had played Baroque violin for quite a short time, actually. And it was also my first um, YouTube release. I was super nervous about it. And something very unexpected happened, which was that um, it went kind of viral and uh, wow. It has almost half a million views now. Wow, so yeah. that was very surprising for classical music and kind of obscure piece like that. Yes. Um, 
so so that was the first one the second one was um from a concert as artist in residence at the national cathedral in washington dc uh in september 2019 and actually this is a photo of one of the rehearsals for the concert so uh, you could see it was this massive massive uh space i think yes, there were about 2500 audience members at the concert and um it, one of our huge challenges for, for me and for the orchestral musicians was just finding um, an approach to sound production that would work in such a big space, especially on gut strings and historical instruments. Um, and then the last video was actually the oldest video chronologically. I think it was from 2013. Um, and uh, this is a picture from the rehearsal. It was uh, I attended the Colburn School Conservatory of Music in Los Angeles, and this was a performance um, at Ambassador Auditorium in a, in, a, in a city that's pretty much part of Los Angeles, but called Pasadena uh, in a, a pretty historic auditorium, actually called the Ambassador Auditorium, and um, we were playing Mozart's Sinfonia Concertante. Um, so I was a soloist along with Christopher Zach, violist who now plays in the Munich Radio Orchestra. And the conductor was Yehuda Gilad, who's also the clarinet professor um, at Colburn. Wow, that's amazing. So you have started studying violin at the age of two. So do you think um, starting to play an instrument at an early age can be of some advantage for the musical profession or not necessarily? So um, I play with colleagues who started playing in all different ways and at all different ages and, um, you know, are including major, major, super famous artists. So we have some funny pictures here. This was, I started with the Suzuki method um, and this was probably one of my very first concerts. I was three years old, I think. Uh, that's my mother behind me who played violin probably for about a year just to, to start with me as an adult. Um, and um, I think that it definitely is not necessary to start as early as I did. This is my father accompanying me. We used to play together a lot. He doesn't play anymore. Uh, it, this was a concert as well. I was probably four years old here, four or five. Same here because it was uh, my first music school. So four or five years old. Wow. Um, and yeah. Uh, so exactly. So I had my father was a an amateur musician, but very serious musician. Actually, this is my cousin who is a prof semi professional violinist. He he studied at the New England Conservatory. Um, he was about thirteen in this picture, and we didn't see each other often at all. But he came to my grandmother's house. I was four, and we played a bit together. Um, so I had this. Uh, semi-musical family, no professional musicians except for my cousin Gabriel, who was, of course, young at that time uh, in my family. But my father studied music very seriously and um, was very involved. My family was very involved in my the beginning of my musical upbringing. Um, here you see some early years uh, photos. So uh, these are some chamber music photos. This was at the Yellow Barn, a young artist program. Um, I think there are advantages and disadvantages to starting so early. Um, I think that the advantages are not things that become unsurmountable for people who start later. So as I said, I've, I've seen and heard artists develop into truly great world-class artists who started playing even as late as 13, actually, uh, or 14. But um, what I do think comes from starting so young is that music becomes part of your mother tongue, part of your native language. And so um, it's very natural. And um, and I think that, you know, I gave the topic of this talk, of this interview as music as expression. And I think from that point of view, for me, um, it has given me a kind of fluency that I can't say whether or not I would have it having started later personally, right? Because, but, um, you know, my father used to have theories about like 
left hand dexterity and things like that that it had been good for that and I'm not really so convinced that it's necessary for that I have even students who started at the age of nine and things who have unbelievable um, dexterity so I think in terms of uh, of course what is the disadvantage that at the age of two um, a child's brain is really really undeveloped and so things like concentration and focus are not really happening at that age. So I think um, even four or five, well, four, even I think even four would be a much more sensible age for somebody to start. And I think brain development is significantly more advanced at that, at that age. Yes, yes. Okay, so in your musical career, you seem to perform mostly solo concerts. How do you prepare yourself uh, technically and emotionally? before a performance in order to be as expressive as you want? Um, good question. So the solo concerts can mean many different things. First of all, this, this picture is from an unaccompanied recital that I gave in the Netherlands um, two summers ago. And in the past, let's see, what has it been? Um, actually almost six years already, I've been giving a fair number of unaccompanied recitals. And that was something that was new for me when I started doing it. Um, of course, I had played unaccompanied music on other recitals. So sometimes I would play a big recital program, mostly with piano, but maybe there was a piece of solo Bach or, you know, some uh, piece of contemporary music unaccompanied. But giving a whole, um, usually unaccompanied recitals are never more, almost never more than an hour because it's even for the listener, um, the, you know, presenters tend not to be bold enough. They think that it might become boring after more than that time because it's only one instrument, right? Um, playing unaccompanied recitals as a violinist for me has been a huge uh, learning curve and very interesting experience. You know, pianists do it all the time. Right, yes, yes. but we don't as string players, and um, and so there is really a an emotional preparation as well as a technical preparation that goes into uh, that. Well, of course, that goes into any performance. I mean, here you see, I was uh, soloing with an orchestra in Norway and and sort of directing as well. And well, here co-directing actually with the keyboard player. And the previous photo, uh, it was still a solo concert in the sense of soloing with orchestra, but I had two co-soloists. So those are all very different um, kinds of experiences. And of course, they all require a technical and an emotional and a scholarly preparation almost. But what's different in um, an unaccompanied recital is that you alone have to maintain the attention and the interest of the listener from beginning to end. Um, and the only feedback loop that you have is with the listener in a way. So, you know, when you're playing with colleagues, whether even it's just a pianist or a harpsichord player or or more colleagues in the case of an orchestra or um, multiple soloists. Yes, yes. You have this feedback loop with the other musicians as well, yes. where you give an input and they respond, or they give an input and you respond. And when you're alone, it's really just you yourself, the violin, and your audience. So um, I. But, but and in, in any case, I mean, there are different challenges when you when you solo and you direct an orchestra as well. That has its own kind of preparation. Uh, you have to have control and mastery of uh, many more parts, right? Because you have to sort of, in order to give meaningful input, uh, like a conductor, to the orchestral musicians for them to come with you, you have to have mastery of all of their parts. And so that requires a different kind of preparation. And especially uh, in a lot of the music that I play in that context, which is mostly, let's say, Baroque and classical repertoire, um, there's very little information in the score, if you, if, you, if you know what I mean. There aren't so many dynamic indications. There aren't so many articulation indications. So, in, and, and that can be true um, even in other, in an accompanied uh, repertoire from that 
period, those periods or in chamber repertoire. And so a lot of that preparation is actually about finishing the compositional process and going in and making a dynamic structure, especially if you're going to be directing an orchestra, you have to be very clear about it, you know, indicating the articulations that you're going for. Um, and there's also that repertoire also leaves room for some improvisation. So then, you know, deciding where you're not going to finish the compositional process beforehand and you'll finish it on the spot. Um, but, you know, again, going back to this unaccompanied thing, um, you, you go into this sort of preparation mode that's almost a little bit monastic, if that makes sense, you know, where you, you start to uh, spend a lot of time with yourself, spend a lot of time uh, with yourself, with your instrument and with the music. And I think um, one of the things that I mentioned actually in that image of the National Cathedral in Washington, which was so massive, one of the things that um, in any kind of concert situation is very important to me, but I think in an unaccompanied performance, it becomes, the importance becomes amplified, is really um, knowing as much as possible about the space you're going to be playing in and the um, kind of relationship that will be possible with your audience. So in the two images ago, you saw me uh, standing on a sort of circle in a tent. Yes. Yes. And in that concert, the audience was all around me, actually. They were in a circle around me. And that was really interesting. Um, one of the pieces that I played in that was the Berio Sequenza, um, which is a, an, a huge unaccompanied piece of music. It's about 14 minutes of music, really virtuosic um, 20th century piece for solo violin. And I played that and I played the Bach Chacon. And as I played them, I actually decided to slowly turn so that all of the that the audience would would be played to uh, directly so these are the kinds of things that go also into a preparation that was kind yes. of a long answer sorry but <laughs> so 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 then the solo the projection and the balance will be different right for different combinations like solo and group mm-hmm so during that time when you performed on the stage solo on the ring on on the platform uh -huh. did you have mics or it was purely violin only purely violin yeah wow yeah. and then and i'm i'm sure one thing is that definitely it's very different is uh the rehearsal time where you need to fix a time for everyone to come together rather than you playing so <laughs> you'd be surprised i mean the funny thing is that when you of course right so in the preparation you don't need to rehearse with other people so that's a, a plus but somehow when you're preparing for a solo concert it's not just like practicing by yourself for playing with other people it becomes really like rehearsing with yourself in a way if that makes any sense yeah. yes yes i kind of understand it. but then uh talking like uh, technically between uh practicing with others and practicing alone what is actually like what is the difference technically if, um yeah. well one of the differences is that when you're playing alone you never have to argue with anybody you you have the last say right so um when you're playing with other people even even people that i've played with for years and years and we know each other's playing very well it's very unlikely that we're always going to have the same ideas about everything. And so there are always things to discuss and or think try trying different and and that has a ton of richness too. I mean, I think that the most um, meaningful musical learning that I've done in my life has actually just been from playing with world class artists um, and learning sort of by osmosis in that way what what it is how it is that they do what they do and why it is that what they do is so effective um in terms of communicating to the listener yes okay so in your repertoire you seem to range from very early music to contemporary music what are the elements that you find interesting in such different musical languages that make you want to put them together in a project yeah so um it's to me music uh 
again, it's about expression, it's about communication, it's about humanity, uh, it's about connection. And so <clears throat> anytime that I'm programming concerts, whether they're my own solo and accompanied concerts, sometimes um, some actually rather successful ensembles have asked me to, to help them with their concert programming. Um, sometimes it's for chamber music concerts I'm going to play, whatever it is. Um, I like, and whether it's old music and new music or um, uh, all old, what, whatever the, the, the question may be, I think that you want to create a sort of narrative that, that people can follow that um, maintains the listener's interest and attention and sort of show gives a range of um, emotional experiences for the listener. So I think that to me is very important that that a program, whether it's a recorded program or a live program actually, does not, it has to have both coherence and contrast. So, um, but, but going back to the specific question about early music and, and new music, you have here um, a photograph from when I was a student at Colburn. In fact, the, the white-haired man is my teacher, Mr. Lipset. And the other fellow who are, the, the two men who are in this photograph as well, are the composer Avner Dorman and the pianist Chunche um, Yen. And Chunche is uh, now a, pro a professor in Taiwan, a very really accomplished pianist and Avner is a wonderful wonderful composer and we Chunche and I had just given the west coast US premiere of of uh, violin sonata of Avner's so um I started playing let's call it contemporary music when I was around 15 years old just almost by chance um I was asked for a concert to play a piece of American music written after I think 1985 this was in the early 2000s and I played a piece by Elliot Carter, who was still living at the time. Um, and it was challenging and, 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 and stimulating for me. It was a new language for me. Um, and then people liked how that went and started, and composers started asking me to play some of their music. And I did become interested in, in the music of our time, first of all, again, on a human level, what is it that composers are re reflecting in their music? So, and I think part of what's interesting about that is, is it's always a reflection to some extent of its time. And so um, I've lately, when I've done these projects with new and old music, it, it's been a pretty specific thing actually. And this is a picture of after my final master's exam in the Netherlands, my teacher Vera Betts, um, the concert master of the Asko Schoenberg Ensemble, Joseph Puglia, who studied, we studied together since I was six years old with a teacher in New York as well, and my great friend Yoon Hee Lee, who um, is also a great violinist of contemporary music. She's played with all major European uh, new music ensembles. So. Um, and in this exam was one of the first programs where I really experimented with the connections between uh, 17th century um, virtuosic experimental violin music, let's say, from this style called Stilus Fantasticus, and then Italian contemporary music from about the 1970s that um, even though the language was extremely modern, it used um, a lot of the spirit and also compositional techniques of that 17th century music. So I, you know, again, looking at um, what, what are our sh shared elements of humanity across uh, geographical boundaries, but also across chronological boundaries. I find that very interesting. So one of the things, for example, that I found, there's a contemporary Italian composer called Salvatore Sciarrino, um, who has, he writes um, incredible music. He's one of my favorite contemporary composers, but a lot of times um, the music almost sounds not like the instruments that are playing it, but like sounds from nature 
uh, let's say bird bird song or wind and he what he's able to write and notate um, that one quite easily achieves then on the instrument so does not sound like the instrument immediately it's fascinating and this was something that in the 17th century they were already experimenting with in somewhat of a more stylized way but major composers Frescobaldi, Bieber, um, a bunch of others were experimenting with birdsong, were experimenting with different kinds of animal sounds or other extra, extra musical sounds and, and, and trying to really um, evoke that in an obvious way. So two totally different times, two different worlds, but similar uh, inkling towards what they wanted to experiment with and express. Wow, so how does it feel to be playing uh, their composition? Yeah, um, there are different talent. When you put such chronologically and let's say stylistically different music together, sometimes there are challenges. One thing that um, I've experimented with was when I first started doing it, I would play on two different violins. So the contemporary music I would play on a modern violin like actually, which was not a modern, it was a violin from 1856, but with metal strings and, you know, and, and the other music I would play on a Baroque violin. And as I kept doing it, that became a little bit um, superfluous, I felt, because the Baroque violin was then often tuned a half step lower than the modern violin. And the, for, for one thing, on a technical level, you know, on the modern violin, you have the chin rest and everything is becomes at a, at a certain angle. On the Baroque violin, you don't and everything becomes at a different angle. Um, but also, I felt if I want to show the connection between these two worlds, why don't I level the playing field and bring them as close as possible? So I ended up um, playing everything on the same violin from 1856. It's a beautiful instrument. Um, with gut strings though, no chin rest, and I changed just the bow. And so um, that's been how I've found the solution to that. And I think that allows me to engage with the music more um, just for what it is, and instead of dealing with all of these technical and equipment issues. And I think it allows the audience also, it breaks down a barrier for the audience between the old and the new, where it's sort of seamless. Oh, okay. So um, I'd like to give out a message to our attendees and our viewers. If you have any questions to ask, just type them in the chat if you're on YouTube and in the Q&A if you're in Zoom. So moving on to the next question, these pandemic times have seen many cancelled live performances. So how are you coping with the challenge of expressing yourself through music nonetheless? And are there any projects at the horizon? So um, until now, I've done a variety of things. This picture is, uh, I run a summer course, the Brizigella Summer Music Academy. And you might recognize Sebastiano Severi, my partner on the all the way on the right, who came in for another session. And we recorded with friends in New York and Los Angeles a Bach chorale. Um, we did a number of this was another recording that we did for one of the faculty concerts. This was in the harpsichordists' garden. So, you know, some out. I did have two um, real outdoor live performances with major audiences this summer, but. Apart from that, it's all been um, virtual until now. Some live streamed concerts, uh, you know, with an audience present, some pre-recorded things. But starting in the end of March, technically, I, I un unless something happens, um, I am scheduled to go back to live performance. And um, I start with two unaccompanied recitals in Germany and the Bach Thuringer Bachwochen Festival. Um, and then in May, I have some US concerts. I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. Yeah. And then if you go to the next photo, there's a, a cellist that I play with very often, Mauro Valli, who's um, the greatest Baroque cellist in the world. I mean, he's just absolutely a genius of the Baroque cello. And um, we almost every year have gone to play um, at this little series in Sweden, and we're supposed to go um, have a number of, of uh, Swedish 
performances and master classes and, and things like that. But um, the other thing, the other sort of projects that are cooking are um, home, more home recording projects, um, potentially some kind of ambitious ones and still experimenting with uh, equipment and all of that. It's been a real challenge because I'm not technologically uh, savvy <laughs> at all. Um, but with Sebastiano, actually, we just in the past few days have been doing some new video recordings, experimenting with that. Um, and we are working on a project actually of Bach keyboard pieces, but on violin and cello. Oh. Um, and maybe juxtaposing that with some con with some commissions from uh, contemporary composers here in Italy. Um, I I have actually uh, several re actual record you know CD uh, projects in the works with my label Rubicon Classics, but the next one was supposed, which I think was supposed to be already done pretty much by now, was an uh, was a concerto project, and obviously having that many people from different places fly to one place to be in a room together has not been possible in the pandemic. So I'm curious about what's going to happen. We'll see. Wow. Okay. So. Um, in addition to your performance career, you are also a professor of violin at the University of Delaware in USA. How do you teach your students to be expressive through Zoom now? And how did you do so in person when it was possible? Well, I actually have to say, um, while many of my colleagues have complained about Zoom, of course, it's not the same as being in the room with somebody. There are certain limitations, but there's also a tremendous amount that we can do, and especially with the high fidelity sound mode, um, good microphones, good speakers. Um, this is a picture of, I also teach uh, sort of in an artist in residence capacity master classes and things at a fabulous music school called the School for Strings in New York. So this is a very young um, student who was playing for me in a master class pre-COVID about two years ago. Um, this is, I did also a seminar for the Boston Youth Symphony Orchestra. This was called Music as Expression, actually, but it was about historical performance practices. This was from that. Um, how do I teach my students to be expressive? I make them sing things uh, for one thing, but I try, you know, we try to attack issues from as many different angles as possible. Um, my sister is an actress, she's a theater person, and she came into my studio class and uh, gave a workshop on, on acting for musicians, sort of almost method acting for musicians, right? So really getting into the character of what you're playing. Um, but, you know, even things like sound production, I found that through a combination of what I'm actually hearing and what I'm seeing the student doing, you sort of get a good feeling for what it is that is happening and what it, and and it's a lot about the imagination because you know they're not the students are not able to get into a big hall and work on you know projecting in a big hall, really being in the big hall. So you have to sort of um, and this is a great tool for the future because. We cannot always practice in the spaces we're going to be playing in. So it's sort of about using the knowledge that you have to imagine a certain uh, circumstance and and working to play to that circumstance. Um, but we do all of the normal things. I mean, all of the technical work and, and, and all of the musical work. And as I say, in terms of dynamics and sound production, I don't find it to be that much of a challenge actually on Zoom. And I and I've a fair number of my most esteemed colleagues actually have also been really having tremendous success uh, despite the limitations of the technologies. Um, and, and as I said, Sebastiano and I ran an entire summer course that's normally live um, online this summer. Ch the students did chamber music, virtual chamber music, had uh, tremendous number of master classes. The chamber music thing has been interesting. Um, and I think it was what I was most worried about. I, te I coach chamber music at Delaware, at the University of Delaware as well. Um, but through a combination of 
you know, sending each other recordings back and forth and practicing with the recordings. One person themselves recording in an app like acapella all of the parts of a given piece. So they're really getting to know the score. Um, and then the Zoom coaching is where one person, whether it's me or a student, is unmuted, everyone else is muted, we take turns. Again, a lot of singing, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of working on music as communication, which, which is a very old concept. And, you know, I do um, some historical performance and uh, this idea of speech in music, of of expression, of, of ex emotional expression, human expression, um, and communication goes back to the beginning of, of Western music, at least. And I would imagine that in other, in musics of other cultures, that this idea of expression may be in slightly different um, contexts, but still of some kind of uh, reflection of human experience. I think that's what it's all about. Okay, so uh, I believe you have read about our JPO. So what do you think about uh, the activities that we are doing right now? So um, I, I read about it, yes I did, and I, what most impressed me actually um, was the outreach program, um, and I, that's very impressive to me, um, what you guys are doing with that. I mean, I wish I knew more about the other programs, but but it seems like a very uh, healthy, varied musical uh, diet and uh, and and context. So you know, very stimulating for musicians. I think this program, um, the interview program, I've seen a few of them now, is a really nice idea as well. So okay, so. We shall move on to the Q and A session. I see there's already a question. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So for the first question, hi. You were saying about the suitable age and not necessary to start so young. So what is your opinion regarding those young violin geniuses like Himari Yoshimura, a seven-year-old Japanese Grand Prize winner for the recent international Grimaud violin competition? So I actually haven't heard, I, well, I maybe have heard Himari, but I don't have uh, Himari in my mind uh, particularly. But um, in my experience, you know, I attended Juilliard pre-college from when I was 12 until I was 18, and I saw a lot of these kinds of situations of, of young, very, very young musicians with tremendous amounts of pressure on them who were garnering tremendous amounts of success. But um, what I can say to that is that I think that that seven years old is, for in my mind, most of the time at least, too early for that kind of exposure and that kind of public exposure and that kind of um, pressure. And I don't think that it allows a musician to uh, develop in as multifaceted and, and complete a way as will be necessary to carry them through a, a long, fruitful career. So, um, and in fact, if you look at a violinist like Hilary Hahn, who's obviously unbelievably su successful at an international level, um, she talks about how her teachers and you know, certain conductors like David Zinman, who sort of took her under their wing, made sure that she didn't have those kinds of pressures at that early of an age, because it can be very detrimental, actually, to the longevity of yes. a person's artistic development and career. Okay, so moving on to the next question. This is from Sebastiano Segre. <laughs> Thank you, Sebastian. How many hours per day one should practice to keep up with professional needs, in your opinion? So this varies. Um, it varies because of all kinds of things. You know, one, when you're on the road, for example, you're traveling and you don't, you might not have as much time um, at your disposition as you would like. Um, 
what I, so I, instead of giving an amount of time, I think when you're studying, when you're a student, there is an amount of time. And I think that the ideal amount of time for everyday practice is four hours a day. Now, that's not to say that I've not, there have been times in my life when I've practiced way more than four hours a day. There have been times in my life when some days you can only do two hours, some days maybe you can even do only an hour because especially in professional life when you have you know nine hours of teaching you fit in half an hour where you can another half an hour where you can you go grab lunch do 15 minutes and then maybe stay at when you finish do an hour or so so in professional life uh, that has to be flexible what I do um, is I'm pretty religious and Sebastiano knows this but I'm pretty religious about scales, arpeggios, and double stops, and certain basic bow strokes. And that is thank you to my wonderful teacher, Robert Lipset. Um, I, for me, that's like a daily yoga practice or something. It's like I cannot miss it. So, um, and in fact, I really pretty much refuse to, except on really extreme occasions, maybe a train was late, you have to go right into the rehearsal, but. I, I, I almost never agree to rehearse without having done those things. Um, oh, but then do you treat it as a practice or do you treat it as a like daily thing? It, or like, how do, how do I say this? It doesn't feel like a practice. It's more like, like what you need to do. I'm not sure, am I? It does feel like practice to me because every day is different, right? So every day we wake up and, and, and which is another reason why I can't answer that question so directly. First of all, some of it has to do with the repertoire that you're balancing. So there have been, when I say that there have been times in my life when I've practiced way more, there was a crazy period in my life when I was preparing for a major international competition that I practiced um, anywhere from four to 13 hours a day. That's too much, but, but it, that did happen, you know? Uh, and that was because I was juggling four hours of repertoire. That's a lot of repertoire. Um, so difficult repertoire. So it just depends on, and it depends on the kind of day you're having. You know, if you're not feeling well, um, you're going to just maybe do a little bit of slow work just to keep your muscles limber um, and hmm, yeah, flexible. Okay. So moving on to the next question. When you are working on your programming for a concert, would you program it in such a way you would start from the earliest period, like Baroque, to the contemporary? Not necessarily. So um, again, going back to that exam in Amsterdam that I mentioned, um, I started that program, which had music, again, from the 17th century, from the 18th century, from the 19th century. I started it with the Berio Sequenza. So I think you, what I tend to think of in terms of start opening a concert is you want to open with something, whatever is going to really grab the audience's attention from the very beginning. I almost never start with solo Bach. <laughs> okay, almost never. If it's an all unaccompanied program and it, it happens to be the right thing on rare occasions, but with some trepidation. I see another yeah. question is coming. Yes. Hello, Alicia. What would you say the pros and cons in between physical playing music together with other, other musicians at True Online? Okay, so obviously when you're physically uh, in a room with your fellow musicians making music together, you breathe together. Um, there's a level of spontaneity where uh, the reaction times are very, very quick and literally you know, by the way that somebody starts a sound, you can change the way that they finish that sound. What I found um, to be a pro about this online way of making music is that very quickly it allows you, it actually, it obliges you to know music incredibly, incredibly well sometimes with a very fast turnaround time, right? Because as I said, there's not that flexibility and there's not that um, instantaneous uh, response time where you're creating something together in the moment that, that you're molding and changing. Uh, 
so because of that what i've found to be the most helpful thing as i mentioned with the students is if i'm going to be recording let's say the first violin part of a le clair duet and another violinist somewhere else in the world is going to record the second part before i send my part to him or her to record their part i'm going to have recorded myself with myself playing the other part right having started each one uh as the first recording so i really really know how the pieces are fitting together and what it feels like and i think that's something that's very good to take into um chamber music and ensemble preparation even when we go back to playing in person um and before covid uh it was a way that I, I did often work if I had a short time to prepare, let's say, uh, to play with somebody I didn't know, new repertoire, I would take even with piano. Um, uh, Richard Egar was mentioned and we did very informally some Schubert together at some point. And to prepare the pieces that I hadn't already played, I had like two days before we were going to meet and read these things. I played my part and sung, let's say, the right hand of the piano while I was playing my part. And then I would play the right hand of the piano and sing the left hand. So I think as much as we can oblige ourselves to know the, the score as thoroughly as possible, that's good, whether it's virtual or live. Yeah. Uh, like now you're saying you're by singing and playing like you play your part and then you sing the right hand part of the piano right in sing do you mean like you really sing it or do you I sing really it in your mind? sing it I really sing it yeah and it took a lot of training to be able to do that um I don't know if anybody's ever made you count out loud while you're playing before it's a very similar kind of feeling um and it's hard at the beginning but this is you know I know that there are, I'm sure there are more than just string players listening right now from the orchestra, but for string players, at least when we play things like Bach fugues, it's a very helpful, even if you have to do one measure at a time, really, really slowly, um, you play one voice, you sing one voice and you, yes. it's a way that we can get a little bit closer to what pianists kind of naturally have of being able to juggle multiple voices. Uh, very convincing. Oh. Then we'll say um, that singing in your mind is uh how does it say uh singing like singing literally singing is better than singing in your mind yes oh okay okay so um next question is would you say you can express better through music than true words It's a different kind of expression, right? So if you want to ask somebody, you know, if you want to order a pizza for dinner or a certain type of dish for dinner, you're not going to uh, play them a melody. But if you want to express um, in a very vivid way an emotional experience, uh, or even some kind of other sensory experience, like we talked about bird song and wind and Shireen, then I think music is a much more um, immediate and sensory, uh, vivid m mode of communication. Wow, okay. okay. So, um, in terms of practicing, right, is there actually a period of time where you feel demotivated and you just don't feel like doing it anymore. Is there, is, is there a time where you had this problem? Um, it's really hard to be a musician. And, you know, I've played music since I was two. So for almost my whole life, there are definitely times when I felt demoralized. And I think anybody who, um, who says otherwise to you probably would be lying. Um, but I've never wanted to stop playing music. I just, um, there are definitely days you don't feel motivated, like practicing, you know, it's a beautiful day outside and uh, you've been cooped up practicing for days and days and days. And, um, and my answer to that is, you know, even Heifetz, 
he would take the summer off very often, you know, a month or so in the summer off from playing. That's necessary. It's not possible to, I mean, not necessarily that you have to take a month off or something, but the, the time away from the instrument is very, very necessary to have anything meaningful to say when you come back to the instrument. But I think, um, and also, you know, not feeling like a fraud if you do have moments of feeling demoralized. It happens to everybody um, for all different kinds of reasons. You know, maybe you play a concert that you're not satisfied with. Uh, I had a very funny experience actually, just probably about three or four years ago. Uh, I was going back to New York. I live in Italy now. I was going back to New York to play on a, actually a small series, but it was a series that I really admired as a kid. It's called Barge Music. It's this series on a boat. And they had told me it was a sold out concert. I was really excited about it. And then it happened to snow that day. And it snowed so badly that there was almost nobody there because it was at a sort of awkward location and people couldn't get to it. I, and I had been expecting to walk out and see, you know, a sea of faces. And I walked out and saw my grandparents and, you know, uh, my best friend, you saw a picture of Yunhi, this great violin, a contemporary music violinist, and a, a couple of people that I knew. And I was so demoralized after that, that I was depressed for a week. And of course it was a force of nature. And, but it was, it was just sometimes, you know, when, when something goes contrary to our expectations, I think yes. that can be very demoralizing. But um, I think, one thing that it's taken me probably most of my life to learn is that we are humans before we are musicians and we cannot be um, successful musicians in the sense of uh, successfully reaching listeners, right? Successfully communicating with listeners without respecting and honoring our humanity. So I think it's just all about balance between the rigorous, um, rigorous sort of training and study that's required of us, and also letting go of that and being human. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the answers. So we are coming to the end of this interview, and on behalf of JPO, we would like to thank you, Alicia Silverstein, for dedicating your time and energy into this interview despite the pandemic that is happening right now. We would also like to thank everyone who has attended and supported this program. You guys have been great. I hope you guys got the answers you wanted. And for those who are waiting for your answers, please stay as Alicia Silverstein will answer your question through the Q&A below later. Please check for the link at our JPO Facebook page and stay tuned. And for anyone who is interested to share any of our program with your family and friends, it will be on our Facebook page, Jesselton Philharmonic Orchestra. And now I will lead the prayer to end tonight's program. So please pray in whatever faith you believe in for the COVID-19. Dear Lord, we lift to you our concern for people who are more likely than others to become severely ill from COVID-19. The elderly and the people with chronic health conditions, protect them from harm and be their comfort in this time of uncertainty and for many, preventive isolation from loved ones. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And that will be all from us. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Alicia. Goodbye. For having me.